Hello and welcome to this repair tutorial and today we're going to look at a ProSound 200 power amplifier. This is probably the first power amplifier where I've provided an audio tutorial although on the channel you will find hundreds of different repairs for power amplifiers. They are distinctly different from hi-fi amplifiers and we'll sort of allude to that in some of the video and this, uh, this description here. So first off when you look at the specifications, the RMS power output is 50 watts times 2 8 ohms. It can go up to 85 watts with 2 times 4 ohm speakers connected. And this is due to the audio output IC design which is used in the amplifier. And what you have are dual TDA7294 audio output ICs. So they are powerful, they're sort of up to 100 volts operation. And as I said, you know, they can deliver up to 100 watts as well. Um, the other thing that the IC has, it has a delay turn on and for this amplifier it doesn't have an internal speaker protection system using a conventional relay so when you power up the amplifier this soft start feature is standard within the IC. And then often with power amplifiers you'll see that the peak power is also detailed in the spec sheet and I would say it's sort of a, bit, a little bit kind of misleading for the user or for someone who's looking to purchase a power amplifier. When you see here like ProSound 200, you know, during normal operation, you're not going to be delivering 200 watts of power. What it's saying is that if the input signal, you know, spiked, then it could deliver 200 watts, but just as a peak power, it's not going to be able to do that continuously. The other thing with this amplifier is it doesn't have any fan cooling. Many audio amplifiers do, and if you're using them maybe um, in a studio environment, or even you know, depending on the user, you can find that quite annoying. Here what they have are very large heat sinks, and then on the top as you can see here, you have some large vent grills. Of course don't cover them, and then that will help to dissipate the heat but there's a small amount of hum from the toroidal transformer but nothing really noticeable and if you were using this you know, in a small music venue of course you wouldn't hear anything at all and then as with all amplifiers which are power you will normally have LED indication and that could also be a bar graph but for here a single LED indication which sort of flicker on and off as you hear the input music sort of peaking and then, and then coming back to normal and the clip that's a protection function so it will allow you know for slight overdrive of the input channels but uh, the LED clip is designed for protection and which just prevents you from overdriving and then with power amplifiers you always have these independent channel controls so you see channel 1 and channel 2 you may refer to them as channel 1 being the left channel and channel 2 then being the, the right channel and then we call it rack mountable so when you look left and right you can see that you could position this into a rack and this overall chassis is what we call 2U in terms of height and then weight for the amplifier is 5.5 kilograms and overall dimensions is standard for a 2U amp so that's 480 millimeters by 88 by 240. Now when this amplifier came into the workshop it really came in with a number of of, of sort of different issues and often with audio amplifiers which are used in power um, applications I might have mentioned this previously but they don't tend to have the best life all right so normally it's not like a hi-fi amplifier where maybe they have regular servicing um, and they take pride of place they could be used in portable applications so they're sort of thrown around a lot and lots of different connections being made and then and then removed so you tend to find these combinations. So when you look at the video, the first thing straight away, as soon as the top cover is removed, there's this very, very thick layer of dust coating everything. And the screws are quite difficult to remove. And a few of them were slightly rusted. So it told you that it was sort of been maybe in a humid or a little bit of a damp environment. So the first thing to sort of do here is really to take the amplifier apart. So what I do is I remove the main power amplifier circuit board which also contains the power supply as well and I'm just wiping all of that out of there make sure that the chassis is all clean and then the same around the toroidal transformer and because I, I could see how much dust was inside I, I wanted to remove as well 
the front panel which contains the volume control potentiometers and also the LEDs on there as well. There's two presets but these didn't require alignment which are normally used to set the um, operation of the LED on the front. So this is where you have the signal level so it's equal for equal signal uh, coming into the amp. So once the amp was all cleaned the next thing was really to focus on the issue and the issue was that the amplifier did not power up at all. Now historically with this make and model of amplifier some users will see that the LED on the front which when the amplifier is turned off is white but when it's powered up it changes to blue. It is not uncommon to get this LED to fail or sometimes there could be dry solder joints on the back of the board but there's no other indication at all that the amplifier is on so just be aware of that if you think you know I don't appear to have any sort of front panel indication from the power point of view that it could be just down to a dry joint or that the LED needs replacing first check here at the rear of the amplifier you have a protection fuse so normal continuity or resistance check Flicking the power on and there was no resistance at all so indicating open circuit now it could have been the toroidal transformer but before condemning it of course you have to make a number of measurements so because the top cover was removed I could measure directly the primary of the toroidal and there was resistance and that was fine so no concern I'd already verified that the fuse was good and also the fuse carrier I'd say it's commonplace but you could have an issue maybe with a warm contact or maybe a contact not making inside the fuse holder no issue and then continuity then from the three pin plug through to the um, one side of the fuse and then to the neutral and again no broken wire no damaged fuse inside the plug so the only thing that remained was the power switch and what you can see in the video is this um, large rocker switch it's not illuminated and simply just disconnecting the incoming mains cable connections and then the connection going back to the toroidal transformer resistance check and verified that the contacts were open circuit on one side so that was the issue that's why it wasn't pairing up you'll also have on the connection across to the transformer there's just a small snubber which is on there it's soldered in place and then you go onto some crimp connectors so just remove um, you just pull it off with with the trot with the pliers you don't need to solder onto anything and then what they've done during manufacture so it's a little bit kind of tricky you have to remove the front fascia and then what you'll then see is this glue and there's glue which is bonded around the switch so just be very careful because you've got to remove the switch of course to replace it just be very careful for your eyes make sure you, you know there's no sort of any of these glue flicks up and causes damage so just use some eye protection and then once that glue is removed rather than just fit a standard rocker switch what I did here was just to do a bit of an upgrade so I fitted an, a, an illuminating uh, rocker switch so for the user in the future they'll be able to see straight away that the power is coming into the amp and then um, you know that, that sort of in, enhances that then now the video also shows the control panel now because this amplifier had no form of service work done when you adjusted the channel 1 channel 2 volume controls they were very very difficult to turn and very very noisy so that was why I, re I removed them from the metal chassis so first off is just to spray some deoxid into the carbon tracks you get full access because the boards have been removed and then just rotate them backwards and forwards multiple times and then what you will have is like the dampening stroke um, grease which is used for lubrication so again once you're rotating backwards and forwards you should be able to free that up and you'll know straight away because these are dent type potentiometers so for people who are new or maybe not familiar with this in audio electronics domestic hi-fi often the potentiometers are not what we call dent so they're very smooth in operation in power amplifiers it's very common that they use dent type so it's a little bit like a tumbler on a safe as you rotate them you'll hear them index around and it just able enables the user then to balance up the two channels so as soon as the potentiometer was clean what I'm just making sure is that you get that nice click effect 
and that's really a very positive feedback to the user as they're using those controls. With the main board also removed, always look for dry solder joints. This make a model, I say it's super common, but yes, you always find on the front control boards just solder joints which are not that great. So good practice is just to re-solder those connections and then also on the main amp board as well as a, it also contains the, the power supply. Um, and that's kind of it. So not really sort of a sophisticated repair, you know, straightforward replacement of the switch. Unfortunately for this video, what I could not do is show you a schematic or a circuit diagram of the amplifier. There appears to be uh, nothing in the public domain that I can find. I have looked. Um, but you could pull down the data sheet for the TDA 7294 <clears throat> if you wanted to gain more insight. Um, the manufacturer of the IC also provides detailed information about how the IC would be implemented. Uh, test circuits and also an example where you could create your own sort of monolithic one channel audio amplifier. They even provide the circuit board diagram, which is useful. But, it, you know, this isn't like a dual power output IC. You would need two for the two channels then. Um, so that's it. So that sort of brings us to a conclusion for this overview tutorial. As always, if you have any questions or you need any support repairing audio amplifiers, email audio amplifier servicing at AOL.com and I'll be more than happy to respond back to you and provide any guidance. And uh, I thank you for stopping by. Until the next time. Cheers. Bye bye.